Tennessee Capital Report is made possible in part by a grant from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Tennessee. Some games aren't played for glory. Some are played for more important reasons. That's why we partner with schools to re-energize physical education with Shape the State. With additional support from the following members of the Tennessee Credit Union League. Welcome to Tennessee Capital Report. I'm your host, Chip Hoback. The 2017 session of the 110th General Assembly continues, and March generated a number of headlines that we'll cover in today's show. A highlight for many Republicans was the presidential visit to Nashville as 100 lawmakers were in attendance at the Hermitage when President Trump honored Andrew Jackson on his 250th birthday. The legislature also marked the end of an era as its longest serving member, Senator Douglas Henry, passed away and became the first public figure to lie in state in the Capitol in 100 years. But the task of governing marched on as the Senate Transportation Committee passed an amended version of Governor Haslam's Improve Act. On today's show, we'll hear from Senator Jim Tracy about the Senate's mix of tax cuts along with an increase in the gas tax. The House seems to favor a different approach to funding transportation, and Representative Ryan Williams will update us on their progress. Representative Craig Fitzhugh and Senator Jeff Yarbrough will provide a Democratic point of view to this year's session. And we'll also hear from House Finance Chairman and Representative Charles Sargent about health care reform in Washington and its potential impact on the state budget. It's a lot to cover in 30 minutes, so let's get started with Senator Jim Tracy. Joining me now is Senator Jim Tracy of Shelbyville. Welcome. First time we're on Tennessee Capitol Report. First time. Glad to be here. Great. Now, you've been promoted. You're now the Speaker Pro Temp of the Senate, and you've got to fill in one time there. Tell us what that feeling was like. It was really exciting for me. Uh, I've been in the Senate now. This is going on my 13th year, and being involved in the Senate, being one of 33, and then all of a sudden you're presiding. It's a big challenge to do, uh, but I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to, to do that, to stand up there and preside. State of the State Address, one of the big things is the IMPROVE Act. We're talking about transportation and backlog and a lot of the, bud, the uh, projects for transportation across the state. You've been involved in that for about 10 years. What's the latest on the transportation and the IMPROVE Act? It, on the IMPROVE Act, the Senate has got involved and we made some additional changes over what the governor proposed. We went and we stair-stepped the change in gas and diesel. For example, first year it would be four cents on gas second year five cents on gas, third year six. Diesel, it's four cents first year, seven second year, 10 the third year. And we added much more additional tax cuts. There's a lot more tax cuts involved than there are the increase through transportation funding. So how different is that than what the governor proposed? Actually, quite a bit different. We did away with the indexing. The governor had indexing in there. The governor also had rental cars, uh, increasing the tax on rental cars. We took that away. Uh, local option is still in there. We have revamped it a little bit just sort of hit the major cities in the, uh, in the state, not the smaller communities. We also did some other things uh, to make it, I think, a better bill. And there'll be some more changes as we go. Uh, there'll be caps on the local option where they can cap it and they'll uh, do that. So we've, we've, we think in the Senate we made it a better bill. Well, we're talking about tax cuts. Specifically, what are some of the top issues where there are tax cuts? And if you can itemize those for us. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, first of all, sales tax on groceries, we're going to at least cut it 1% across the board. That's the way we've designed it in the Senate bill. We're going to cut uh, taxes for veterans on their property tax to give them some property tax relief for veterans. The elderly and disabled, we're also going to give them a property tax decrease on their home and their property. Those are some, uh, the hall income tax, we're going to reduce another 1%. Uh, the franchise and excise tax for businesses to keep us competitive with all the other states around us so we can 
continue to recruit and bring in businesses. Just so people know, the viewers know, we really only have two uh, types of revenue to balance our budget chip in Tennessee. We have the sales tax and we also have the franchise and excise tax on businesses. That's it. And so if we're out of rounds, which we are, we're a little high on our franchise and excise tax, we need to cut it to be competitive so we can bring, help continue to bring businesses into Tennessee. Does this solve the problem long term for the backlog on projects? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that question. With my experience of being the chairman for 10 years, uh, my feeling and many of the folks that deal in transportation across the country think it should be done by user fees or by people that use the roads, which would be your gas and diesel tax, which is, for example, me, I travel 35, 40,000 miles a year. I'm going to pay more tax than my dad who travels maybe 500 miles a year. He's 87 and he doesn't travel very much. Plus, if we use the user tax or the user fee, the out-of-state out of trucking companies will pay 30 to 40 percent of the funds out of what they use because they are traveling on our roads. And it's much better than using the uh, general fund money, and I don't think that's good public policy to use a general fund. What are some of the major projects at the top of the list? I know people in Nashville complain about 440. It's been scraped off in potholes and all that for years, and I know there's other major projects across the state. How does that balance out? major project would be uh, 440 is one. There's also a major project in Memphis, large price, like $60 million project in Memphis that, that uh, is very important. I tell you one thing that's overlooked, Chip, across the state is the bridges. Uh, which is a safety issue. We have bridges all over the state that within the next 10 years, they're going to have to be replaced. They're 50, 60, 70 years old. They're going to have to be replaced. So the bridges are key, not only for so transportation can move, but just for safety purposes. If you've got school buses that cannot travel over those bridges or fire trucks that can't travel, it's going to be key. And, and that's why we've, we think it's, it's got to happen. And, Roads and bridges are long-term projects, Chip. That's why I think we need a dedicated fund to do that. And with my experience over the past 10 years, the states that use a dedicated fund are much better off financially. All right, Senator Jim Tracy from Shelbyville, thanks for joining us on Tennessee Capital Report. Thank you, Chip. One of the biggest portions of the state's budget is TennCare, Tennessee's Medicaid program, which is funded in a larger portion by the federal government. With all eyes on Washington as Congress considers a repeal and replacement of Obamacare, TennCare Director Dr. Wendy Long recently warned that proposed changes in Medicaid could have a significant impact on the state's budget. Let's watch the clip of Dr. Long's testimony and then we'll hear reaction of Representative Charles Sargent, Chairman of the House Finance Committee. The AHCA, in addition to focusing on repeal and replacement of the Affordable Care Act, also focuses on major financial changes to how the federal government funds Medicaid uh, to states. And so the federal government's goal um, is to cap their exposure. They don't want this to be an open-ended funding stream to states anymore. They want more predictability in their budget moving forward. What all these capped funding structures have in common is that they increase the amount of financial risk that the state takes on. So as the federal government caps their risk, we take on more risk. If all we get is capped funding and no additional flexibility, it could have very, very serious budget implications for the state. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, until we see exactly what the federal government is going to do, uh, you know, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen yet. Uh, we could get a block grant, and there's a lot of advantages to get a block grant, but there are also some disadvantages because if we add things after we get the block grant, they could be paid at 100% at our cost and no additional funds from the federal government. So we have to be, you know, very diligent in seeing exactly what comes out of Washington. Well, we just have to plan our budget the way we know what it is as of today. It's hard to plan to an unknown factor. Like you said, on our 10 care, we get a two to one match. Under our CHIP program, we're getting a three to a four to one match. Uh, so if those matches stay in place, we could be okay. If they went down to a 50-50 match, it, it can be very expensive. Our reserve fund for 10K, if I went back several years, it was about $450 million. 
uh, today's level, it's approximately $240 million. So the reserve fund for 10 care has been cut, you could say almost in half, in the last six or seven years. And part of this, uh, as you know, one of the big costs of what's happened on health care is prescription, uh, prescription drugs and everything. It's going up at a staggering rate where we kept it at 3%, 4%, and now it's going up 8 9%. So with inflation going up on prescription drugs at that high of a rate, it's very difficult to keep up. I, never, I am one that never wants to raise taxes. But in the last couple of years, uh, with the Affordable Health Care Act, we had to put a number of people back on 10 care. Our roles on 10 care now are at the highest level they've been in a number of years, where we had about a million, million one. We're up to about 1.5 million people on 10 care. So we have to be very conscious of that and have to make sure we have the money you know, to sustain these programs. But we have to be very conscious and not just think we have all this extra money and then find ourselves in a hole two years from now. The state budget is certainly the General Assembly's biggest job every year. And now here for more insight on what's happening in the House is the Republican Caucus Chair Ryan Williams. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here today. Now, uh, the Speaker of the House called you one of the rising stars in the Republican Party. You've been brought up to Caucus Chair. How have things changed for you since you've gotten the new role? Well, it's changed quite a bit. I am now responsible instead of my own vote every day. I'm responsible for uh, helping take care or assist 73 other members of the House of Representatives and talk to them about policy and, and things of that nature and also help them with their re-election campaigns in a couple of years. That's one of the uh, unfortunate things about being a House member is it seems like you're running all the time. But uh, it's been great so far. The uh, reception has been really good. Um, my biggest role really is communicating with members about what they can expect, uh, new and old alike. Uh, as it relates to what transpires on a day-to-day -day basis in the House. Well, the Transportation Initiative, uh, the IMPROVE Act, is what we've been talking about a lot lately, and I know you've been involved in that. Uh, where do you think that's going to head? I know there's a lot of different ways on how to pay for it. It seems like everybody wants to attack these projects, but there's different ways to do that. Right. I think one of the good things uh, that Tennesseans should take away from this process, I think one of the things that we do agree on is that there is a problem. You know, I think uh, when the governor talked about this the first time, maybe four years ago, there was an argument uh, with most of the legislators, is there an actual problem? So once we know there's a problem, usually there's an opportunity to fix it. The challenge is right now from the House's perspective is that we're really divided on how it should be fixed. Some think that because we're over collecting uh, tax revenue, we should uh, just divert that money or even give a tax credit back uh, to the citizens through cutting taxes. Uh, another way in which we could, uh, some doing it is, is some are in support of uh, the governor's plan. Uh, very few, uh, I might add, but there are some with the Senate's new program that was rolled out last week. Uh, I guess the Senate calls it a compromise with the governor. There is some favor for that, but uh, the House Transportation Full Committee meets tomorrow and hopefully they'll decide the fate of the governor's bill. But it seems to be difficult every time because you've got the House version, you've got the Senate version, and we've got to come to a final bill. Right. In this case, the, the House and the Senate, I can't remember another time uh, in my short tenure here uh, of the House and Senate differing so, so much on their ideas, uh, and particularly in the Republican uh, caucus ourselves. There are two varying different ideas, and they're seems to be the only place if we can agree even in our separate chambers that we're in a conference committee sometime in the future uh, that's if we can get the bills to move forward at all one of the other issues you've been involved with and the governor's proposing that uh, the broadband initiative to bring internet access to some of the rural communities right it's a really important part of what the governor's plan is this year uh, he asked me to serve on the rural development task force uh, the governor's task force uh, this past summer uh, I, along with Senator Gresham and hundreds of stakeholders across the state, both city and county and state departments as well as private groups, met and discussed these issues to try to find out how we can better serve these. When, uh, when areas do not have those kinds of services, it's very difficult to grow retail when you can't use a check card. You know, it's hard to have a, a pay at the pump when you don't have the ability to do that, even though you might be in a rural area on, on the lake 
if you don't have the ability to grow business or tourism there, it makes it a huge challenge uh, for us. And so it was great to see the governor's plan this year. I think it really uh, culminated this plan of grants for different ones and providing access based upon those underserved areas is a good idea. I think uh, most good ideas have some controversy in the beginning, which this one had. It seems to me that uh, in communicating with the stakeholders now that we've gotten to a place where everyone can agree. And so I look forward to, to seeing that investment pay dividends for those rural areas across the state where jobs are in, are in such desperate need where we don't have the access to these kinds of services. One of the er other areas you've been pushing for is uh, autism. There's a new bill with autism. Tell us a little bit about what that is and what it's uh, planned to do. Right, it's, uh, to me it's actually not a new bill. Uh, to the funding uh, side, it's actually a new bill. I actually carried a similar bill to this last year. Uh, what it does is it creates the Autism Spectrum Disorder Committee. When I first ran for office in 2010, I knocked on the door of a mother uh, and she didn't answer the door, but I could hear kids in the background. Well, she was actually in the minivan trying to get her third child, her son, who had autism, out of the vehicle. And uh, she told me at that time, Ryan, there's just not enough opportunities or services for mothers like me. And even if they did, I'm too busy to find out what they are. What the Autism Spectrum Disorder Committee would do is it partners state agencies with families. And they form a committee to help better inform Tennesseans uh, and the studies prove that one in 68 kids in our schools today have some form or level of autism. This helps us meet the need better going forward and help get these services to these families who desperate needed, uh, desperately need those help, in particular, in particularly in rural areas like, like mine. All right, well, thank you for taking the time to be on the show. Oh, yes, yeah, my pleasure. At the top of the show, we mentioned the passing of Senator Douglas Henry, a legendary figure in Tennessee politics. Senator Henry served in the Senate for 44 years, and he made a lasting impression on those who still serve the state today. We want to take a minute and remember a truly great man. Let's watch this. As long as anyone can remember, Douglas Henry has been the senior senator from Nashville. Three years after his retirement, Senator Henry passed away on March 5th. As he lay in state at the Capitol, Everyone said goodbye to an era of Tennessee politics. Douglas Henry was an institution. He was our guardian of federalism. He stood for our state. He pushed back against federal encroachment. But when it came to financial matters, he set the stage for the success we're enjoying in Tennessee today. He was one of the most conservative, frugal, fiscal policy scions of the state of Tennessee. There'll never be another one like him. Henry will be remembered as the longest serving member of the Senate for his 11 terms in office, but many will remember him for his kindness, sincerity, and thoughtfulness. The Senate paused for a moment of silence to honor him. He really treated everybody as equals, whether it was the governor or the the janitor or the person in the cafeteria. But he was a great man and, and we lost a great, great individual. He was just a kind person. You know, he never, he was never hostile. And if he asked you anything, he would, he would be telling you the truth. I think that's, that's the one thing that we remember. He would always tell us the truth. I was newly elected and not only was I a freshman, but I was a Republican, which at the time I was in the minority party and I was the only Republican from Davidson County, so I was kind of like the bottom of the barrel. And there was one person that extended graciousness and kindness to me, and that was Senator Henry. A champion to many, a statesman, and a man who truly loved Tennessee, Senator Douglas Henry will be greatly missed. He had such historical institutional knowledge and uh, even when he left the General Assembly, there were plenty of phone calls made to him uh, uh, because we still needed his sound advice. Governors come and go, but there was always the senator. I hope the entire state will join in our remembrance of Doug Henry because he will not soon be forgotten. I think his last words on the state senate floor said it all. His last words were, be always kind and true. And wouldn't this be a better world if that were the case?
Joining me now, Representative Craig Fitzhugh from Ripley and Senator Jeff Yarbrough of Nashville, the Democratic leader of the House and the caucus chair in the Senate. Welcome back to the show, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be Thank here. Thank you for joining us. Senator, let's start with the Approve Act. Uh, in the Senate, uh, what is the Democratic view on this and, and are you supportive of what's going on? Well, I voted for the proposal that that is advancing in the Senate. Um, I mean, I think that when the governor's proposal first came out, our two biggest concerns were one, whether it's going to really provide cities and, and towns the ability to deal with the traffic challenges they're facing. And I think two, whether we're going to make this equitable, because if we're going to see an increase in the price that people are paying at the pump, we think those people should be the ones that get tax relief. And uh, the proposal as it's advancing through the Senate is at least moving in that direction. Instead of uh, being a tax cut for very few, it's actually expanding the cut of, on the food tax, which everyone pays. Well, being in a super minority, I guess it's difficult to change a whole lot of things, but what are some of the things you're focused on in the House? Well, the, the House, our caucus, the Democratic caucus, realizes that we do have a problem with infrastructure, with highways and bridges and going forward with our transportation system. So we, we understand that and we know you just can't go forever without increasing revenues for some of those things, especially since we've had some reductions from the federal government. So we're open to the ideas. I think I would agree with what uh, the Senator said, that we think that those that pay that gas tax, if there's going to be tax breaks given, as there are in the governor's proposal, that those ought to flow to those that, that pay that, uh, that, that buy that gallon every week and also buy that gallon of milk every week. So we're, we're a proponent of lowering that uh, very high food tax that we have in Tennessee. We also have another proponent that doesn't track exactly uh, with the gas tax, but would be something that, that our caucus thinks would be good and, and may allow us to, to uh, um, uh, look at the gas tax a little closer. We have a huge surplus, a lot of it one-time money, and we would like to see the governor sort of expand his um, Tennessee promise to include uh, uh, pre-K through 12. Uh, with, a, with a fund, a separate fund that we made up out of reserves and uh, surpluses uh, that could continue to grow, sort of like an endowment, where schools could use that fund uh, for things that were, uh, you know, uh, better reading coaches uh, to get children to read by third grade, uh, uh, some program to uh, uh, make sure that, that uh, older students have the ability to get that Tennessee promise. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, we can use those one-time surpluses wisely and uh, extend our growth in our positive things in pre-K through 12 education. So uh, what are some of the areas uh, that you're focused on uh, other than the IMPROVE Act? Well, we, uh, the, the Democratic Caucus is, uh, is generally opposed to, to using uh, public money for private schools, the vouchers. And uh, we've, we've been able to push that back three or four times in, in legislative sessions. and. Uh, uh, we think that that's coming up again in a sort of a, a narrower version, but we still remain opposed when our uh, funding for uh, education is so low to remove that uh, funding and put it to, uh, uh, to private vouchers uh, is just not the right thing for the private schools nor the public schools and the children that, that attend them. So we're going to be looking to push that back once again. What are some of the areas of focus in the Senate? You know, I think the surplus right now amounts to about $200 for every man, woman, and child in Tennessee. And what we ought to do with that money is do something that actually benefits all six million people in Tennessee. So uh, what Leader Fitzhugh and I proposed was eliminating a lot of the food tax, eliminating some of the diaper taxes that are paid for by some of our youngest f families, investing that money into education and in healthcare and in job creation, those things that actually really uh, work for people, instead of small programs that are either gonna give tax cuts to a very few or provide private school uh, vouchers to a very few. Senator Yarborough, we've talked to you in the past about some of the criminal justice legislation that you've been behind. What are some of the key issues facing us with the criminal justice system? A lot of opioid problems going on across the state. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that the opioid problem is actually crippling large portions of Tennessee, but rather than devoting the real resources that we need to on the law enforcement side or on the criminal sentencing side, we've still got lots of money plowed into um, sort of over-criminalization of 
uh, non-dangerous drugs like marijuana. Uh, Representative Fisk, you, your name has been in the news as a potential candidate for governor, and that's coming up in a couple of years. So where are you in that process of making that decision? Well, you said a couple of years. It seems to be a long way off, but, uh, but apparently not. So uh, yes, I, I'm considering it and uh, talking with my family and some friends and, and my, my colleagues about, uh, about going forward. I have, uh, I have a duty here at the uh, legislature to get through this legislative session, so I'm not in any super big hurry to do it, but, uh, but uh, I must say I'm leaning toward that, uh, that decision. Thank you, Representative Fitzhugh and Senator Yarborough for joining us again on Tennessee Capital Report. My pleasure. Thank Enjoyed you. Enjoyed it. Well, that's our time, but we'll see you again on April 30th for the winding down of the 2017 session. We'll review the key bills that have passed and update you on the debate over the budget and transportation funding. We'll look forward to seeing you then, but now we leave you with good advice and the final words of Douglas Henry as a state senator. I'm Chip Hoback. And I want to leave you with these words that we used to sing every Sunday when we went home. Now Sunday school is over, but we are going home. Goodbye, everybody. Be always kind and true. Goodbye, everybody. Be always kind and true. Tennessee Capital Report is made possible in part by a grant from Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Tennessee. Some games aren't played for glory. Some are played for more important reasons. That's why we partner with schools to re-energize physical education with Shape the State. With additional support from the following members of the Tennessee Credit Union League.